Welcome in, welcome back to the Touchdown Black and Gold Vlog, where we examine, discuss, honor, and celebrate all things college football across the entire college football landscape, but with a special emphasis on our beloved black and gold squads of the Missouri Tigers and the Iowa Hawkeyes. Thank you. Welcome back to all of you who have given me your support, your time, much love for you. It's been a long, grinding season. I have a very special episode lined up for you today. Uh, before I say much more, once again, thank you for all you've done for me and for the channel. It has become a great success. I always uh, welcome and want... Uh, any sort of comments, any likes, shares, subscribes, I appreciate and thank you for everything you've done once again. And unfortunately, the season has come to an end for our Iowa Hawkeyes and the Missouri Tigers. But we do have one game left upcoming on Monday night, the national championship game between Georgia and Alabama. Uh, but my special episode today, I just wanted to share with you my reaction and recap to the 2022 Citrus Bowl that happened down in Orlando, Florida on January 1st, the game between our Iowa Hawkeyes and the Kentucky Wildcats. Now, notice there, I did not say instant reaction. Um, as I record this today, it is January 5th. I've had plenty of days to take it in, get my thoughts together. And plus, it's been a very crazy busy time around the parks, um, homestead the last few days. So that's why I wasn't able to give you an instant reaction uh, to the Citrus Bowl. But hey, good things come to those who wait. And so here we go. So as you can tell, I've donned my Citrus Bowl uh, apparel, uh, this nice tropical shirt, one of, a great gift from my wife. Opened this up on Christmas Day, broke it out during the Citrus Bowl. So definitely wanted to share that with you. And thanks, honey. Love it. Um, where to start with what happened in the Citrus Bowl? First thing I want to say is just pass on my congratulations to coach Mark Stoops and the Kentucky Wildcats. Final score being 20 to 17 Kentucky over our Hawkeyes. And, but I am very happy for coach Mark Stoops. This is his ninth season at the helm at Kentucky. And if you watched my Citrus Bowl preview episode, did share with you uh, the Iowa roots and the connection there between Mark Stoops and the University of Iowa football program. Once upon a time, Coach Stoops was a defensive back. He played at Iowa and began his coaching career as a grad assistant at Iowa. So it was hard to root against them, but just wanted to pass along my congrats to him, his staff, his players, the students, alums, the community. Um, like I said, his ninth year there, he has basically turned... Lexington into Iowa South. I mean, just staying slow and steady, you know, staying in his lane. They absolutely there. They have created a culture, an identity, and it has absolutely paid off. He is getting them to the postseason um, each and every year, seven, eight wins. That's kind of what we've been able to expect out of Kentucky. And side note, uh, with that victory, it gives Kentucky... 10 wins on the season. That is the fourth time in their program's history that they have won 10 games or more, and two of those have happened under the watch of Coach Mark Stoops. So congratulations. That's where I like to start with that. Um, now, as far as the game, and I am going to say this, just kind of summarize maybe a little bit of what we saw, both good and bad, that a lot of these bowl games outside of the college football playoff semifinals and the other New Year's Six Bowl games, a lot of these bowl games end up being exhibitions for what we have next year or in the future. Uh, by the time a lot of these bowl games come around, we always seem to have 
um, players opting out. That's happening way more frequently now. Injuries, uh, dudes who have entered the transfer portal. But overall, this was an excellent game, highly contested. You could tell the players on the field wanted it. They wanted to be there, and it did matter to them. So for Iowa, I am. let's start with the positives from what I saw, what we saw, the black and gold family from our Hawkeyes during the Citrus Bowl. In the absence of running back Tyler Goodson, Iowa's most ex explosive, dynamic offensive player, he decided to opt out of the Citrus Bowl for goal his senior season. He is entering the NFL draft. Iowa turned to the to, uh, Williams and Williams. It became the Williams and Williams show. And that was the very young running back duo of Gavin Williams and LaShawn Williams. And overall, this young duo of running backs did hold their own. Now, saying that, I will... Kind of mention it once again, there were a few key defenders out for Kentucky during this game because of injury or uh, opting out or just unavailable for other reasons. But overall, they did hold their own. Gavin Williams led the way with 98 yards on 16 attempts, good for a 6.1 average per carry, not too shabby Ola. And LaShawn Williams, he added 42 yards on 10 attempts. Good for a clip of 4.2 yards per average. So overall, not bad running the ball. And that was something that, if you watched my preview show, that that was going to be one of the keys to victory. Iowa had to get some sort of traction through the running game on the ground. Um... And a lot of their success was really due in large part to the improvement uh, along the offensive line. You've heard me say this several episodes throughout the season that Iowa's offense absolutely challenged and struggled, to put it lightly, at times during the season. And you could blame this person, that person, this unit but it all really started with the inconsistent play of the Iowa offensive line, which is quite frankly very un-Iowa-like. I mean, what do we turn out to the NFL? Offensive linemen, defensive backs, and tight ends. So it really was a very up-and-down season along the offensive line. And But overall, entering the bowl game in the season, they've been very young, and they have been. So there is a lot of potential for growth. So they absolutely stepped it up on the Citrus Bowl, kind of allowing to open up these good running lanes for those young running backs and also to protect Spencer Petrus. For the most part, his the uh, pocket the uh, pocket for Spencer Petrus was clean most of the entire game. And uh, yeah, right here, the, the Iowa offensive line did not allow a single sack of Spencer Petrus. So overall, well done for the line. Obviously, they're going to lose a huge, huge part of that. I mean, Tyler Linderbaum, Iowa's All-American center, the Remington Trophy winner, hasn't yet officially declared for the NFL. He should go, and I expect him to go. Uh, so they're going to lose a big piece. But overall, the vast majority of that offensive line returns next season. Um... Now, the young line, there was plenty of growth, and I was really, really surprised, and it was nice to see the offensive line hold up the way that they did. Um, definitely gives me a little bit of optimism along the offensive line, and I definitely assume they will be more consistent. At times, they couldn't get much worse than they did this, this season, but I do expect them to be much better next season. Um... Along the offense, I mean, I've got to give props to tight end Sam Laporta. I mean, he is, he will be Iowa's next great tight end. He does have one more year remaining. I don't expect him to leave early, but that news could be breaking. As of now, today, January 5th, I've heard nothing about Sam Laporta skipping his senior season and entering the draft, but he is their absolute chain mover. He uh, accounted for 122 yards on seven receptions, including a touchdown. So Sam Laporta had himself a day, and he definitely did. So props to Sam Laporta. Uh, the Iowa defense. 
something that you know we've seen time and time again. They absolutely held their very own. They put the Iowa offense in a position to win. Very, very respectful showing for the Iowa defense. But like we've seen throughout the season, when push came to shove, the Iowa defense was just asked to do a little bit too much. Um, they held Kentucky's stud running back, uh, Chris Rodriguez Jr., and he was one of my keys to victory for Kentucky during the preview show. If you haven't watched that one yet, feel free to check it out. I don't think you'll like it. I think you'll love it. But that was one of my keys for Kentucky's victory to get him going, and also a key for Iowa to, to a victory was to keep him in check. And overall, they did that. He ended up rushing for 107 yards on 20 attempts for one touchdown. So they did keep him below his rushing average per game. He was not the deciding factor in the Iowa loss, was Chris Rodriguez. Um, but overall, good job against the, the run. And that's what we kind of have expected from this defense. Not just this season, but in seasons past. Um, the young defensive line, really, really good job. I mean, they recorded six sacks. Uh, the Iowa defense did six sacks and an interception. Um, and that gives them 25 picks on the season, by far the most in all of college football. So tough defense. And, but we expected that. I mean, they only gave up 20 points in a losing effort. Um, Wandale Robinson, I mean, I got to give props to him. I mean, he was, he's... Uh, one of Kentucky's, Kentucky's most explosive offensive weapon. Once again, another one of my keys to victory I shared during the Citrus Bowl preview episode. Wandale Robinson, the wide receiver, the medical miracle that he is, and I, I say that because by my count, he left the field four times, but quickly returned only one or two plays later. Hmm, if you catch... If you catch my drift, if you can pick up what I'm putting down right now, potentially. Had himself a, a day, ended up with 170 yards receiving on 10 receptions for a 17-yard average. And he, will, he himself was responsible for the two biggest plays by the Kentucky offense. Um, late in the first half, a third and long after back-to-back -back sacks, it's third and twenty-six. And Will Levis finds Wandale Robinson over the middle for a pickup of 30. Huge pickup on third and way long at that point. Led to a Kentucky uh, field goal, I believe. And the other one late in the game, late in the fourth quarter. Just one bad breakdown by the Iowa defense ended up costing them. Wandale Robinson got loose and ended up breaking off a 52-yard uh, reception down to the Iowa one-yard line. And two plays later, that led to the go-ahead Kentucky touchdown. So Wandale Robinson definitely had himself a day, and that proved to be one of the keys for Kentucky winning the game. Oh, now we get to the bad. And it's been the undeniable truth all season, the lingering, ongoing problem with Iowa their offense, I've already said that about the offensive line, but it's got to start with the Iowa quarterback room and Spencer Peters. Coming into the bowl game, we, weren't, we didn't know who was going to be the starting quarterback on January 1st, whether it be Spencer Petrus, who is the incumbent, or Alex Padilla, who, if you recall, he did see legitimate action in three games this year while Petrus was hurt. We didn't know. It wasn't released. We assumed it would be Petrus, and it was. And that is what has to be fixed. And I don't know either one of these cats. I've never met Spencer Petrus or Alex Padilla. I never will have no relationship with them personally. But this is what has to be fixed. Um, overall, Spencer Petrus played the entire game. Final numbers, he was 19 of 30. For 211 yards, which that itself isn't bad. One touchdown, but to three big interceptions. But one of those I'm going to chalk up. It's on the stat sheet as an interception, but at the end of the first half, 
He threw a Hail Mary to the end zone. It was picked off. So that's one of those interceptions that, yes, officially it's an INT, but is it really? When you do that kind of a risky throw, that's what's going to happen. But overall, three interceptions. And that's what the lingering issue is, here is with Spencer Petras. Um, Spencer does some things very, very well. And he does. And overall, his record as a starting quarterback at Iowa is still very impressive. He basically he started every game last year in the COVID-shortened season, went 6-2. and two. He started uh, the majority of the games this year. He started, ended up starting 10 of them. Uh, Padilla started the other two and came in in relief late in the third quarter of another one of Petrus's starts. So he's had legitimate time, legitimate reps. He's actually been in the Iowa program for three years. Um, but still, what Spencer Petrus is doing, the things that he does well, he still is doing just enough to get us to lose, to, for us to be defeated as an Iowa football team. Multi-year starter. And when I watch him throughout this season and even last season, I hope I'm wrong about this, but my gut tells me I think that we've seen the ceiling of Spencer Pedras. I think he has reached his ceiling. Now, I could be wrong, and I hope I am. Maybe he could slightly improve over the offseason with more reps, get himself more accurate, fix his footwork. The guy does have happy feet. He's like a little mumble back there. I gotta love happy feet, by the way. Um, so maybe he can fix those things and slightly improve, but it is not going to be an improvement of night and day, a total 180. It is not going to be that. And that's what concerns me. And that's the question is, where do we go from here? What does the Iowa coaching staff do with their current quarterback room issues? How are they going to fix and solve it? Um, and quite frankly, I just don't think that Spencer Petrus has that it factor. I just don't see it. Um, but this day and age, this is my philosophy. And I know what Iowa football does. All of us do. That's why we love them. We know what their identity is. Run the ball, control the lines of scrimmage, set up the play action. And I know we're not all blessed to get the next Michael Vick or Lamar Jackson or Tim Tebow. Cats who could throw but could also tuck and run at will, move the chains, always moving forward. Not every program can get those guys. In Iowa, that is not what we are going to get because we don't run that kind of offense. But in this day and age of football, what it has evolved to you have to have a cat in the backfield when things break down or just to get positive yards has to be able to tuck and run a little bit. And Spencer Petrus is not mobile. He is not fleet of foot. And that has compounded the issue this season with the offensive line issues to where they're blockers. They have holes that are like Swiss cheese at times. Spencer Petrus could simply not escape. You have to have somebody who is more nimble. Alex Padilla absolutely has shown us he can roll the pocket, get himself out of trouble, and if worst thing happens, turn it upfield. Pick up some yards when Spencer Petrus hasn't been able to do that. But the it factor and his inconsistent footwork, I just don't know what we do. I think I know what's going to happen, and I'll share that here with you very, very soon. Um, and I think also for Spencer, the game hasn't slowed down to him yet. And I, once again, I don't know him, and I'm not trying to bash him, but from what, everything I've read and what I've seen, he is a awesome teammate, definitely a locker room guy. And one of the biggest issues that we have with him as Hawkeye fans is sometimes he tries to make too many plays. He forces the issue, which that shows that he's a competitor. Nobody's saying that he does not compete at a high level or that he wants to win, that there is a lack of effort or skill. He has a cannon and electric arm, but the inaccuracies in that first half, and actually really throughout the game, but more 
uh, obvious during the first half. I mean, there were some wide open receivers, even when he was able to set his feet and he had a clean pocket, absolutely overshot his receivers. And a couple times, quite frankly, I couldn't tell if he was trying to hit them or throw it away. Just that inaccurate. And that has not improved. It has not through the last two years of Spencer Petrus's time as the IO starter. But to compound the problem, getting back to Alex Padilla, I don't know if he's the answer. I mean, we've had a very small sample size. In the games he played, yes, Iowa won. They ended up uh, being 3-0 and in those games he played. But they were against less, very less stellar defenses. Probably three of the worst defenses in the Big Ten. He faced Northwestern, which was statistically the worst defense in the Big Ten. Illinois, near the bottom. And Minnesota, who's no slouch, but they're not an upper-tier defense. And also, Alex Padilla completed less than 50% of his passes. So that's why I don't know. We don't know. Is Alex Padilla the answer? It is so unknown right now. What is going to happen in the offseason? And by the time we get to... Uh, next Labor Day for 2022 kickoff, and I can't wait for that already. I got to go into my nine-month slumber, my my little depression that I do with lack of college football. So that's the problem, is what's going to happen between Spencer Petrus and Alex Padilla. Um, moving forward, I don't know who to name the starter. But if I'm Alex Padilla and his family, in the age that we live in, of the transfer portal, where if I ain't starting, I'm departing. After watching that first half of the Citrus Bowl with how ineffective Spencer Petrus was and some of those errant throws, I also believed, like he did, probably, and his family and his supporters, he deserved to play the second half and he did not see the field. So what I am saying, I absolutely expect one of those two to transfer out and find a landing zone elsewhere. It really depends on conversations that those two individuals will have with Coach Kirk Ferentz and his staff, and also when they look at their options, what might be best for them. One of those two QBs is going to leave. There is no doubt in my mind. And right now, if I had to pick, I think it would be Alex Padilla. But... I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. And that's really up to Coach Kirk Ferentz and his staff to get to find an answer, to bring those individuals, those young men in separately and say, moving forward, this is who we're going to go with or we're going to go with you. Feel free to make whatever decision you need to make, which you think is best for you. We will help you and we absolutely support you and wish you nothing but love and luck moving forward. So moving forward, I think the quarterback competition is going to be this. Moving into uh, spring, summer, and fall ball, we're going to have a quarterback competition between either Spencer Petrus and the current third-string quarterback, Joey Labus, a freshman from Ohio who currently has been running the scout team, but by all reports, is making waves. He is getting people's attention. So maybe Joey Labus might be the, the next best answer for Iowa. We don't know. So I believe next year the quarterback competition will be between Spencer Petrus and Joey Labus or Alex Padilla and Joey Labus. And I'm telling you, what I've seen, some of the footage of Joey Labus, very nice. Another Barat uh, a reference there. So that's where I think Iowa goes. And it's uh, going to be a war of attrition. Who's going to leave? Who's going to stay? Um, just to summarize how poorly the Iowa offense has been this season, I'm going to have plenty more to say about this. Uh, next week, after the conclusion of the season, after the national championship game is over and we crown a victor for this season, I'm going to have two very special, special separate episodes. I'm going to have an in-depth a review on the seasons for both Iowa and Missouri. So I will talk more about the Iowa offense during that episode. But this season on offense, Iowa averaged under 300 yards 
of total offense per game. Um, that is the second lowest in the Kirk Ferentz era. And remember, we just saw the book close on year 23. He has been the head coach for 23 seasons at Iowa. And statistically, this is the second worst offense they have had under his watch. But to me, when you look at the worst offense, that was his very first year in 1999. He took over. The cupboard was very bare. You know, to transition to a new coach, new staff, new scheme, you absolutely expect there's going to be some struggles. So that was the worst year, his first year back in 1999. But if you look at then compared to now, the styles of college football, how they're played, what you try to do as far as living currently in the generation of points, points, offense, and offense, to me, I would absolutely call this the worst offensive year under Coach Kirk Ferentz. Absolutely, is what I would say. Um, and it really has to, it starts and ends with that quarterback play, or in this case, lack thereof. And, and the thing is, most people don't understand. And I had this conversation with my brother a couple nights ago, and Anthony kind of set me straight, and it opened my eyes to where, yes, at Iowa, do we get legitimate NFL starting quarterbacks? No. We're a developmental program. We're not Ohio State or Oklahoma, Notre Dame. Clemson or Alabama, we're Iowa. We're seven, eight, nine wins a year. That is our goal. That's our expectations. Which and we're fine with that. And that's the problem, I think, with a lot of fan bases. Everybody wants to be Alabama. Hey, they make it look so easy. How come we can't be like that? And that's what leads to coaches being fired prematurely, only after two or three seasons. So we know what to expect. We are comfortable with who we are. Yes, you always want more as a fan, but as Iowa fans, we know what we're going to get. We're not going to get five-star quarterbacks. It's not going to happen. But when I look back at the last decade, even beyond a decade, Iowa has had NFL caliber quarterbacks. And that's why I believe the current quarterback room and situation at Iowa is easily the worst situation that we've had in well over a decade. And here's my proof. Yes, let's look at some of these Iowa quarterbacks who were either drafted or were who at least made rosters for NFL teams uh, previously in recent uh, history. Let's start with Ricky Stanzi. Ricky Stanzi played in the NFL for several years. No longer plays, but he was in the NFL. He was on a roster. Uh, Jake Rudock who I know Iowa fans tend to forget him, and for some of us, they want to forget him. He played a couple years at Iowa, then transferred to Michigan, but he made the Lions roster. He played for the Lions and the Dolphins. And just recently, he retired from football. He made a roster. More frequently, Nate Stanley. Nate Stanley, who was a good quarterback, had a good record at Iowa, but simply couldn't get over the hump against upper echelon teams. He's still in the NFL. He's on the Minnesota staff. He's not getting a lot of playing time, obviously, but he's an NFL player. And then even more recent, C.J. Beathard, the guy who replaced Jake Rudock, who led us to that magical undefeated 12-0 regular season back in 2015 before we lost in the Big Ten title game and then got waxed New Year's Day in the Rose Bowl 2016. He is currently still in the NFL playing. He's made numerous starts at the 49ers, and currently he's with the Jaguars. So Iowa does put out NFL-caliber quarterbacks, but either one of these two, are they going to get to the pros? Absolutely not, based on what we've seen. I hope so. I hope next year they're, oh my goodness, complete, complete revelations. That would be great. But yeah, it's, it's an awful situation. It is a tough situation, and tough conversations need to be had, and tough decisions need to be made. But best of luck to everybody moving forward. And that's really all I've got to say. A couple other things. I mean, I'll talk more about this during the end-of-year uh, review show, but Iowa, a 10-win season. And 10 wins, especially in the regular season. They've lost back-to-back -back games in the 
postseason, the Citrus Bowl, and before that, the Big Ten title game. But to get to 10 wins in the regular season, that is nothing to poo-poo at or about. I mean, especially when you think of how bad that offense was, and I just shared that with you. Less than 300 yards a game, ranked in the bottom 10 of total offenses all season, in the 120s out of 130 NCAA Division I teams. And to get to 10 wins, it makes that even more incredible, unexpected, and, and celebratory. It is absolutely sick that Iowa got to 10 wins in that situation. Hats off to their defense, their special teams, and even their, at times, their offense had to execute to make that happen. So even their offense, with all of their their woos and their challenges and their issues, at times they still had to do it right. So 10 wins, still a good season. And if you would have told me that, beginning of the year, hey, let's give you 10 wins and get to win the West and get to the Big Ten title game, absolutely I'm taking that. If you recall, I projected Iowa to go 8-4 and four this year. My ceiling for them was 10-2, and two, so I got that right. But if you would have then especially told me, hey, I'll give you 10-2, and two, Big Ten West champions play in the Big Ten title game with one of the 10 worst offenses in the nation, absolutely I'm taking that each and every day and twice on Sunday. But for more on that, I'll talk more about that next week during the end of year uh, review shows. But I do know this. I do appreciate and thank all of you for what you've done this entire season. It's just about to wrap up officially. But as I stated, the Iowa season has officially come to a, a wrap. But thank you for all you do. Please like, share, subscribe, comment. Let me know how I'm doing. Even if it's something as, hey, I like or dislike the shirt, that's fine. I can take it. If I've left something out or done a gaffe, call me out on it. Just be an adult, please. Let's all act like them. You know how to act like them. And expect on Friday. I have another very special episode lined up for you. Definitely want to tune in for it. I'm going to have a big national championship game preview and prediction episode. And I may be joined by a special guest. Once again, I might be joined by a special guest to help me break down the title game between Alabama and Georgia. So until then, take care of yourself, stay healthy, stay safe, have a great week, and I'll see you on Monday. Thanks again for tuning in to this special episode of the Touchdown Black and Gold Vlog. See you Friday.